Hey guys, and welcome to the Money Podcast. This episode, we're going to talk about your home's value. You know, in many markets, home prices are going through the roof. In 2020, just two years ago, the average price of an American home was about $375,000. Today, $500,000. And with rates rising, affordability is becoming a real issue. So here's the question. Do we jump on board and buy now before prices go up even higher? Or do we wait and see if prices and mortgage rates drop? Today, we're going to try to answer that question and a few more. I am your host, Stacey Johnson. As usual, my co-host will be financial journalist Miranda Marquette. Hello, Miranda. Hello, Stacey. And by the way, Miranda lives in Boise, Idaho, one of the hottest real estate markets in the country. I live in Idaho Falls. I live oh, in I Idaho Falls. Falls. Oh, I'm sorry. I said <laughs> wrong Boise. side anyway, of the state. <laughs> anyway, you live in a hot housing market, okay? I do. I do. Thanks for pointing out a mistake. We're 30 seconds in the podcast. You're already on my back. Okay. <laughs> so, also listening in and sometimes contributing is our producer and and uh, also a, a real estate investor, Aaron Aaron Freeman. Hey, Aaron. Not investing anymore. No, I, I, I don't, <laughs> don't doubt him either. Aaron and I both live in South Florida, by the way, another hot housing market. Our special guest this week is Mindy Jensen from real estate website and podcast, Bigger Pockets. Hello, Mindy. Hello, Stacy. Thanks for having me. And tell me, where do you live? I live in yet another hot housing market, Denver, Colorado, although oh, I, I would be Denver. hard pressed to find any market in America that is not a hot housing market right now. Yes, indeed. And we're going to get right there, too. But West before Virginia. we do, before we do, quick disclaimer, <laughs> should we discuss specific investments in this show, do not take them as recommendations because they are not recommendations. Before you invest in anything, do your homework, do your own research, make your own decisions. Okay, now let's get back to the topic at hand. Mindy, before we begin, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and your business. I was born in a small town. No, I've been <laughs> investing in real estate forever. Um, I started investing in 1998, and I have been what's called live-in flipping. I buy an ugly house. I make it beautiful. I sell it after two years. Two years is important because then I pay $0 on those capital gains up to $500,000 because I am married. It would be up to two fifty if you're single. And then I do it all over again. So I am in my 10th or 11th live-in flip. I took, I moved into a very ugly house. They smoked in the house for 40 years, never opened a window ever. Um, and I came in, I got it habitable, and then I moved in, and I've been fixing it up ever since with my husband. Um, I say with my husband, he's been doing a lot of the work, uh, most of the work. <laughs> let's let's give him credit. Um, but yeah, I've been it, I've been the community manager at Bigger Pockets for the last seven years, and I am involved in real estate, real estate and uh, agent in Colorado, and I've been in this housing market helping people buy and sell in this crazy, crazy, crazy market we're in right now. In a crazy market, it is. And that leads me to a question. The The title of our show is, is the housing bubble about to burst? But is there a housing bubble going on right now, right now Mindy? What What is it? Let, let's start here. What is a bubble? What does a bubble even mean? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Because when I was preparing for this show, I thought, what does housing bubble mean? Because when you asked, are we in a housing bubble? No, we're not in a housing bubble. A housing bubble, when I hear that, I hear housing crisis or imminent housing crisis. So well, it I looked articles. up. It's, it sells articles. Oh my goodness, the sky is falling. The sky is falling. Well, Chicken hopefully little. it sells podcasts too. We okay? need some because clickbait, Mindy. Right. We need some <laughs> clickbait. <laughs> But no, hey, well, but wait, I just though, say the sky is falling. But, but <laughs> so a bubble, that. a bubble means speculation to me. Okay, I mean, obviously, this is a subjective term. To me, it means uh, people are bidding up prices. Let, let me put it this way: they're bidding emotionally rather than logically. So that doesn't mean necessarily that. Well, I guess the bubble kind of implies it's going to pop and everybody's going to get poor. Uh, and so you're saying that's not the case. Well, so that's what I. Thought I thought there was an imminent housing crisis when you said housing bubble. So I went to my good friend Google and I said, what does housing bubble mean? And Investopedia <laughs> says a housing bubble or real estate bubble is a run up in housing prices fueled by demand, speculation and exuberant spending to the point of collapse. So up until that, the last part of that sentence to the point of collapse, that's where we're at right now. Okay. We have a run-up in housing prices fueled by demand, fueled by a little bit of speculation, and fueled by exuberant spending from all these people who sat around during COVID not spending any money. We are not to the point of collapse. Even with rising, uh, rising interest rates, 
I don't think that we are at a point of collapse or anywhere near a point of collapse because we still don't have supply. Uh, what does this say? Housing bubbles usually start with an increase in demand in the face of limited supply. Again, check. So we're, we're hitting all these marks on the housing bubble, which takes a relatively extended period to replenish and increase. And this is where I want to send you to the link that I shared with you from the St. Louis Fed, the new privately owned housing unit starts, which we're, you will link to in the show notes. It shows in 2005, November of 2005, we hit the highest point, or maybe December of 2005, uh, the highest point in new housing starts, and then it dropped to 2010, like less than half, a quarter. They went from 26, uh, what was it, 2.2 to 478. To 2,200 to 478. Yeah, okay. and then thousands of units. Yeah. Huge so, drop. Huge drop. So we stopped supply building houses. Is, so constraint supply is one of the reasons that housing prices have gone up so much, along with cheap money, which is now being solved by the Federal Reserve. Yes. Right? And if you look at the other graph that I sent you with the historic interest rates, it's absurd. We've had interest rates in, I don't know if you remember the 80s when they were 17%. I do, uh, because I do. we couldn't sell a house. I, I remember They've being gone. alive in the 80s, but I wasn't aware I, of interest rates. I became rates. a CPA in 1981. <laughs> Thanks for making me feel old, Miranda. Uh, so I, can add, I, can, I can add to that. Uh, so uh, pre-2008, yeah. uh, home builders, you know, all the DR Hortons and all these other guys, even though they're kind of a small group, uh, they were building about 180,000 homes a year pre-2008. Since that collapse... We're about 4 million homes short of normal. So this is what's propping up prices, right, Mindy? The law of supply and demand says this is what's propping up prices. You've got people who want to buy a house. They have to have some place to live. You have investors who want to take advantage of this very inflation-resistant investment property. Great hedge against inflation is uh, investment is is real estate because you're borrowing money now and paying it back with money that's worth less in the future. And you do this over a period of 15 or 30 years, I mean, that's a really great investment while it's kicking off cash and somebody else is paying off your investment for you. Real estate is a great investment, but investors are not driving up these prices. If you look, pre-pandemic, investors were about 16% of purchases. And post-pandemic in Q4, they Q4 2021, they were about 18%. So a small bump up, but not an enormous bump up. It's not like it's 75% of all houses are being bought by investors. And I bet a lot of people back in the uh, the housing crash, pre-crash days were investors, huh? Like in, in uh, 20, 2009, 2007, 2000, I should say. Yeah, 2005, 2006, 2007. Yeah. And I don't even know if we would call them investors so much as speculators. You're down in Florida. Were you in Florida at that time? Do you remember the condo complexes where you buy now before they've even broken ground and the, com the condo now, is like... Mindy. They're doing that now. They're selling out buildings now. Uh, but I, oh, yes, I do remember that. Wow. My, my house in 2000... I live on the water, which makes my house a little more expensive, but my house is no big deal. But uh, in 2007... Wait, my house is worth... In 2007, it, it went up to about a million one. In 2010, it was worth four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Now it's worth one point six million dollars. I mean, this is this market in South Florida is like the stock market. I mean, it just goes berserk, uh, and yeah. then it crashes. You know. Speaking of which, let's go back to this. Okay, there interest rates have gone up substantially. Okay, here, here's a stat. Uh, let's see. Substantially compared to a year ago. But not yes. substantially compared to historically. So all no, these people true. who have had but, you know, yeah, low interest rates for house, 10 years uh, are freaking out. A million out. dollar house now is going to cost you $13,000 more a year. Uh, uh, the average, the, uh, the, I'm sorry, the median price of a house, I said the average is 500000 at the intro, but the median, a median house is now $429,000. That's going to cost an extra $5,640 a year. Okay, so I, I, I understand because I was, I was an adult in 1980. I know what high interest rates are, but... That you're still taking people out of the market. 
I mean, when, when things cost, when it costs $13,000 more a year for a million dollar house, some people are no longer able to afford that house. I mean, there are going to be fewer buyers than there were two months ago. Yes. True or false? That is a true statement. That is a true statement. <laughs> and it, I think it's important to note back in the 80s when you were paying uh, 18% interest, you were paying that on a $70,000 house, not on yeah. a $500,000 house. Yes, very true. Yeah. And, and, and I think... No, look, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Miranda. You're going to say Oh, something? I was just going to say that's a really interesting point because as you know, I've been going back and forth. I really like the house I'm living in and I've been going back and forth. Do I make an offer to my landlord, see if I can buy it? So I'm running the numbers the other day because, you know, up to a certain point, which was about six months ago, um, like buying the house and paying the mortgage was cheaper. But now that prices in my area have just exploded and interest rates are going up, I was running the numbers and I was like, monthly cash flow wise, it now costs $500 more a month if I decide to buy this house. Well, there you and go. so now I'm just like, so so that brings the question, well, maybe I wait until th- like, will like these interest rate hikes, will will all of this slow housing prices, will we see a crash? Are we, are we going, or even if we don't see a complete crash, are we going to see prices pull back? And you know, do I I wait, right? Is is this something that now am I playing the waiting game to see if we've gone too far and are we going to wait for the pendulum to start to swing back? Every article I've read basically is saying a 10% pullback and it's going to be a soft landing. Okay, now wait, and, let's talk about let's talk about soft landing before we continue this conversation because we're we're getting to the meat here whether people should be buyers or not. But before right, we get exactly. there, <laughs> let, let's keep in mind that the whole purpose of what the Federal Reserve is doing is to destroy demand. That's what they're. That's what this is about, especially in housing, because housing is forty percent of CPI. Uh, you know, so the inflation, forty percent of the inflation we're experiencing is, is directly or indirectly related to housing. So, what the Federal Reserve is doing is they're trying to make it harder for you to buy a house to destroy some of the demand, so that the, so this the, so there isn't a bubble, right? So th- what's happening is th- this is exactly what their plan is. Is, is to make it harder for you to buy a house. That's what they're trying to do. And then, of course, uh, there's uh, you know, all the collateral things that come with that, furniture, blah, blah, blah. You know, so uh, this, is, this is the design of the Federal Reserve, to make, to make companies less profitable, which, and I'm, now I'm alluding to stocks, and also to make houses harder to buy. Just that simple. And they're I just doing read that the and Miami, succeeding at it. I just read the Miami Herald today, too, that um, with that, home builders are actually having a tougher time building homes because it costs more, you know, with higher interest rates and everything, it's costing more to build the homes. And now they are jumping to uh, introducing, because a lot of these guys do their own mortgages. So now they're jumping to ARM mortgages, uh, 321, 21 ARM mortgages, where, you know, they get a little per- uh, points off in the first few years. And then it keeps jumping years after that. And they're also trying to, home builders are trying to put incentives out there where they're saying, oh, we'll give you a free $25,000 kitchen, you know, if you buy this house when it really only cost them 12 grand to build this kitchen. Uh, And these are kind of things that they did around 2008. Yeah, here's something I wonder too. Are they going to overbuild? I mean, don't don't you think, isn't this the way it always happens? Giant demand, not enough supply. I mean, it's certainly here in South Florida, you were mentioning condos. Mindy, I mean, it takes three mm-hmm. years to build the 40-story condo, you know? And so by the time this is done, the market's oversupplied and prices come down, you know? And, and the same thing with cars. I mean, any number of things, right? They, there's a huge demand. So then they build tons and tons of cars. And then they're, and now they have the parking lot. Or their, their lots are full of cars and there's no buyers left because it's a recession. You know what I'm saying? So are they going to overbuild housing? And then would that cause prices to come down? What do you think? Well, like Aaron alluded to just a moment, or didn't allude to, said outright, we are 4 million houses short right now. It's going to take a long time for those 4 million houses to come back. And remember back to 2008, everything crashed. It almost crashed overnight. And it crashed so hard that everybody in the housing industry left. There were no jobs. There was no building. There was nothing. So they left to go find other jobs in other industries not related to housing at all because nothing was going on in housing. They haven't come back yet. 2008, 2009, 2010, 11, 12, 
13. When did they start building again in Florida? They just started thinking about building here in 13, 14. We're just starting to get these big housing complexes back up and running. And that takes time. Like you said, it takes three years to build a condo. Maybe for, Now, are you talking from groundbreaking up or from planning stage to finish. Well, and, and I don't, you know, I was really just spraying that out. I don't know how long it actually takes to develop a 40 story condo, but certainly <laughs> it's it's not counted in months. Well, <laughs> it's going to take right. a while because one, the financing is a lot tougher now because of the inflation. There's a shortage of workers and there's a supply constraint on every product when it comes to building a house. Every and, single you know, thing. And it's very likely that the, the Fed is going to create a recession. Uh, I, I would say the odds are much greater than 50 50. There's going to be a recession. Uh, and and so, so that's going to dampen the, the um, enthusiasm of home buyers too. So or, that gets us. Oh yeah, I was going to say. So that gets us to our our commercial break, and then how we talk about whether you should buy a house. <laughs> yeah, you know, actually, I was just going to do that. I was just going to do that. But when we come back from this break, I want you guys to think about this. It's a yes or no question. Would you buy a house today? Okay, I'm going to give you guys all the time that our commercial break takes. <laughs> to think about that and we're going to come back don't move a muscle we're going to be right back after this brief message okay we are back so basically you didn't get any time at all because that's just a sentence i said so there was, there was no break on this end but anyway so are you a buyer would you buy a house today mindy yes i am looking at a house this afternoon i am helping people buy houses i don't believe in being a hypocrite. I am out there helping people buy and sell houses every day. And I'm looking at a house around the corner. Now I'm not looking at every house around the corner, but there is a house that is coming up on the market that is a value to me. And it is a special set of circumstances. It's on the golf course. So just like your waterfront property, it's a limited supply. So it is already more valuable because it's on the golf course. It is kind of ugly. It's a weird layout and it is not going to appeal to every buyer out there. And that's okay. I have the skills to make it look nice. One of the things that makes it really weird is the doors to the bedroom aren't traditional doors. They're sliding glass doors. Every single bedroom has sliding glass you mean doors. Inside? And it's, inside? You know, it's inside? Inside? Doors? Yes. No, it's weird. It's that's super really weird. weird. Um, so the kitchen is kind of like it's, it needs some work on this house. So I am not paying top dollar for this. I even told them if you want top dollar for this house, I'm not the person that you need to talk to. I'm not offering top dollar for this house and nobody else will either because it's weird. Investors are starting to look at maybe there's going to be a crash. Maybe there's going to be a housing slowdown. I don't personally think that it's going to crash because, again, like Aaron said, there's four million. We're four million houses short. And in my area, we had a fire in uh, on December 30th that took out 1,100 houses wow. in like three hours. It was, we had 90 mile an hour yeah. winds on Talk a day. Talk about that your it hot was real like, estate market. I remember that. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, the Marshall Fire, and it took out it, it took out all eleven 1, hundred houses. It damaged an additional one or two hundred houses in an oh, already tight market. There's nothing to rent. There's nothing to buy here. So if people want to stay here, they're looking to rent. They'll rent this weird house with these sliding glass doors instead of actual doors. They'll rent the house that has the weird layout because it's better than living in a hotel. And it's probably not going to be a rental that I hold forever, but it would definitely be a rental that I hold for several years while, I mean, how can you build 1,100 houses in a year? You can't. Yeah, you're right. It's going to be several years well, hopefully before. hopefully people so. who rent or buy that house will not be throwing stones you know, living in a glass house. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so hopefully Miranda, not. let's move on to you. Are you a buyer yeah, so today? Yes or no? <laughs> Not not this house, uh, but but I think I think the interesting thing that Mindy brings up here is she's buying for a different purpose, and she knows exactly why she's buying yes. the house. She understands the market, she understands the location, and she knows what she's getting into. So she understands the situation. Now I am in a different situation. I am not personally um, 
you know, and I have nothing against real estate investors. Um, I love Mindy. I like Aaron. And so, um, like I have nothing against real estate investors. It's just not my bag, right? Like understanding who you are and what your bag is, is super important. And so for me looking at, okay, for me, it's more, ca- the cash flow is more important, the monthly cash flow. And I am living in this house to live in this house. And so that's different than planning to rent it out. That's different than fixing it up to uh, turn around and sell it for more later. So I I think that it's really important to understand your goals because I'm not buying this house today. <laughs> I'm waiting, you know, I'm waiting to see, okay, do things cool down? Will I be able to make an offer later that makes a little more sense in my situation? Um, so I am taking a step back uh, from, from, you know, cause I did, I thought for a little bit, I thought, oh, maybe I'll make an offer on the house. But now that I'm looking at things and looking at how things have just you know, changed so much. I'm like, that doesn't really fit my goals. It doesn't fit what I am doing. And so it doesn't make sense for me. So I think it's really important as you go through and figure out, you know, what am I doing? Do I understand the market around me? And do I understand the purpose of this purchase before you move forward? Well said. I mean, and I think ultimately, at the end of the day, that's true of anything. We're going to put money right. in, right? Oh, of course. It depends on yes. what your goals are. It depends on what you're what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, like you know, when you think about the stock market, I mean, the, your odds yeah. of success are diametrically opposed to your time horizon. Uh, I, the stock market, whether it's going to go up or down, is a flip of the coin uh, in a day. In ten years, not a flip of the coin. So it depends on what you're doing. Exactly. If you're going to live mm-hmm. in a house for the rest of your life, what difference does it make what you paid for it? Uh, unless, I mean, unless it's really going to go in half. And even then, actually, if you're going to live in the rest of your life, it really doesn't matter. But okay, let, our third panelist, Aaron, are you a buyer today? Uh, unlike Mindy, Mindy's flipping, um, which is, is interesting. I think that's, that's, that's cool. And I think you should probably get away with that, especially in this market. We tend to buy and hold. So we're looking at that price point where if you buy it for X amount of dollars, is the rent income going to supersede that, pay that, give us profit in the end? And as of today, those numbers never match up. So yeah. we have very little funds to to invest with. And if, if we can't make rental income that does everything and works out, it's not a play. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's other outliers here that I haven't really come across in articles and only 60 minutes did a piece on this. And there's, there are companies like these Tricon industry companies out of Canada and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. These guys have been buying 800 homes a month and they're buying them. They're fixing them up for like 20 grand and they're renting them. Yeah. And that's, that's taking a huge chunk of housing away from every, everyday people. And that happened in the, in the uh, crash of 2008, 2009 or 2010, yeah, whatever. And, and and the, the giant hedge funds were coming in South Florida and they were buying up a, a billion dollars worth of houses. And, and they're doing it again. And, and it's kind of worrisome because, you know, things take a while to trickle down through each quarter. And we're sitting here going, okay, well, so the, so the GDP is our, the economy is doing great, whatever. But it takes time. And as if people are pulling back their spending, that takes time for that to get into, you know, the, the quarterly profits. And if all of a sudden those start going down, companies start laying off and then people can't pay these rents. And you got these huge corporations buying up huge swaths of land and it, or homes that people can't pay rent for anymore. Does that start taking down the whole thing? Is that the bubble that we don't know about? I don't know. You know, I'm and just you know, speculating. I'm, I'm throw something else into throw something else in the <laughs> ring here because uh, for a few younger listeners, uh, here's a quote: "Not a single major real estate firm is predicting prices will fall over the next 12 months. Not a single one." Now, yeah. here's here, here you're going to get a message now from cynical Stacy. Let me tell you that any business who makes its living selling real estate is never going to tell you prices are going down. They're, they're, the chief economist for the National Association of Realtors, whose name I believe is Lawrence Yun, uh, yes. it, it's been a while since I've heard. But okay, he let me, still, let me yes, tell you something. He, that's still I was the guy doing still television doing the thing. news in the hottest market in, in, in one of the hottest markets in the United States. I was doing television news in 2008. Okay. And let me tell you that that guy, the chief economist, said housing prices are not going to fall. And and you talk to any realtor, they they literally were saying trees grow to the sky. I mean, oh, you're were. on you're on blast now, Mindy. <laughs> well, hey, I mean, nothing. No, I, I think Mindy's an expert. I'm just saying, be aware that just because everybody in the whole world says prices aren't going to drop, they sure as hell didn't say that then either. They didn't. There wasn't a single person. There's a couple of hedge funds that, that called that crash, but not a single real estate firm did. So if you are going to get advice from people in the real estate business. Now, there are some. CoreLogic, for example, is a real estate um, research firm. So there are places you can get. But if they make their living selling houses, 
uh, then be be take their take their advice with a little grain of salt. So that, that, I just wanted to throw that in there. So uh, I'm I'm not convinced the prices won't go down. I, I'm not suggesting for a second they're going to be down fifty percent. They will not because there's not this as much speculation. But at the same time, okay, now me, we all have different scenarios here. I was actually looking for a house uh, a year ago, less than, uh, and my wife and I looked at a house. We were willing to go up to one point seven million. And the houses for 1.7 million, we're like, well, this should be a mansion. I mean, that's a lot of money. I never paid a million dollars for a house. And so, you know, but they weren't. They needed to be fixed up. So we didn't buy. That house now, $3 million. And I'm not exaggerating either. There are people here who bought houses six months ago for $2 million and put it back on the market for $3 million without doing anything to it. That's the, that's the truth. And so, you know, to me, I don't need to buy a house. The house I live in is fine. I, you know, I was just, do, I was doing that because I, you know, we needed more room because my wife buys more clothes and we have closet space. But, but now I'm, I'm not doing this. I ain't chasing this. I'm not doing it. So I'm, I'm actually kind of a buyer, but not now. I'm not going to do that. And maybe I'll be wrong and maybe prices will keep going to the moon, but I still own a house. So I'm not losing on that end. But so I'm not a buyer now. And I, and I wouldn't be now, you know, at least, I, even though I don't think there's going to be a crash. So what, uh, what should people be doing? Mindy, you're the expert. <laughs> what should people be doing? I liked Miranda's answer where she said she's got, you have to have a plan and That's you right. have to know what you want and you need to sit down and make a plan. This is, I hear people like, oh, well, I wasn't thinking about buying a house, but everybody else is doing it. So I'm going to do it too. Fear of missing out. That is the worst reason yes. to buy a house ever. You don't buy a house because your fear of missing out. You buy a house because you want to live there for a while. A lot of people don't think about how much it costs to buy and sell a house. Mm -hmm. It costs you, the buyer, between 2 and 4% of the purchase price in random closing costs and random extraneous costs. We lump these all together and just call them closing costs. But when you go to sell that house, it costs you the seller between eight and 10% of the purchase price, of the sales price. So when you're going to buy the house, it's more of a nominal fee, although 2% of $500,000 is not a nominal fee. It's still, right. you know, it's still a whole lot less than that eight to 10% of the sales price. You buy the house, then a year later you go to sell it. That's a huge chunk of whatever increase you've had. Yeah, you're going to lose Assuming money. there's an increase. Yeah. You might lose money. Your friends that are buying the house for $2 million and putting them up on the market the next year doing nothing and selling them for $3 million aren't losing money. They're just not making a million dollars on that house because they're selling – they've got all those closing costs. So you have to have a plan. Look at your plan. And yes, life doesn't always go to plan, but you have to have some sort of plan or you're just winging it the whole way and then it's going to turn out worse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, make a plan. Where do you plan on living for the next – three to five years. If you're in a very transient job, buying is not the right choice right now, unless you're going to buy and turn it into a rental. Yeah. And then you want to make a purchase based on rental numbers, not based on what you want to live in. You want to, you know, if you're going to be there for several years, what does your, what are your family plans over the next five to seven years? That's a good time horizon because after that, like you really can't plan for 10 years out. Um, but if you're planning on having children, don't buy a one bedroom condo. If you're planning on have, if you've got three kids, don't buy, you know, a three bedroom house. If you want to have six more kids, you know, think about what you want before you just jump in willy nilly and say, oh, it's a starter house. I'll just buy another one. I hate the term starter house. You can buy one house and live in there for the rest of your life. Not that I have. I'm in my 28th home, but <laughs> I buy but, differently. But that's because yes. you have a plan and you know why yeah. you're doing it. And I think yes. understanding why you're doing it is also super important. Like when you were talking about like FOMO is the worst reason and everything, a lot, a lot of people are just like, oh, well, we're supposed to buy a house. So let's buy a house. Um, or people are like, oh, home prices are going up right now. So I better buy one now. Well, that's a ter that's also a terrible reason to buy a house. Uh, because, yep. you know, it's like, no, take a step back. How does this fit into your long term goals? Does it fit with your lifestyle? Does it fit with what you want to do? Mindy's created a lifestyle that I would absolutely hate, but she likes it. So, so do I, that. I feel thing. like shooting myself just hearing about it. Because <laughs> she, like, she likes that lifestyle. She likes to, she likes going in. But she you, likes you doing can the make projects. a lot of money she likes, doing that, though. Yeah. Well, she, but she likes, 
just finding the like I've I've known Mindy a long time, and so so I I am I should probably not be speaking for Mindy, but I've known Mindy a long time, and I know that she likes doing this shit. I don't know why she likes it, but she does, <laughs> and so I love that's it. great. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that is great, and and you know, and everyone is different. But I'll tell you something, okay? Just before we got on the air, um, I read sixty five percent of houses in the United St- or housing markets in the United States are overvalued, sixty five percent, and that includes where I live, and includes where you live too, um, Miranda. Well, what um, does overvalued mean? Well, this is core logic, mm-hmm. and I, I honestly can't tell you. I don't remember what they said. I believe um, Idaho Falls is the third most overvalued market according to CoreLogic. But, so, yes. so to me, you know, Stacy didn't become a multimillionaire by buying things that were over that were overpriced. I don't do it. Now, again, if I if I didn't have a home and I wanted to buy a house, I'm not that worried about it. I'm I'm 66. How much longer do I have anyway? But 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 my point is though, if I was buying a house in order to resell it for a profit. I'm not doing that now. Same thing in the stock market. And there's no difference to me. The stock market is overvalued and it gets undervalued. It's overvalued right now, in fact, based on based on earnings and based on interest rates. Uh, so I'm not a buyer. You know, I just don't. And then that's, you know, that's, but again, if I just moved to Fort Lauderdale right. and needed a place to but live, I'm going to buy a fa- I mean, this is a really complicated subject because there's a lot of factors moving in here. Yes, um, there are. So Florida, Florida is increased in value a little bit for a couple of reasons. I mean, one... It has been really trying hard to get the tech industry in here and get more industry in general and businesses. And that's going to bring in a lot of money. And and these people are going to sell their homes in California and move here and start buying things up. Same thing happened in Idaho. Uh, everybody moved out of California and in, in, uh, in Washington and moved into Idaho because it was cheaper and they just wanted to have a different place to live. Texas is going through the same battle. Um, so is that going to say, oh, when the market crashes, is Florida going to crash? Is Idaho going to crash? No, because big money moved in. Yes. In it's going to stay. Go ahead, Aaron. What? I'm sorry. No, it's, it's pretty much it. Well, I was, I was going to say, you know, I've done the story about how to buy a house 30 times. You know, I was in TV news, Mindy, for 40 years. Is that right? 30 years. Anyway, uh, and the two most important things that I would urge anyone who's hearing this to understand, if you're going to buy a house, two things you need to know. One, you must be willing to stay there for five years. There are scenarios where you can flip and blah, blah, blah. But generally speaking, five years is your minimum. And two, you never buy a house in an environment where jobs are not growing. It's easy to find out. You can call the Chamber of Commerce at whatever town you want to move to. Are are jobs growing or not? If jobs are not growing, real estate is not going to grow either. So these are very simple things that that you can determine. And and, uh, you, you look skeptical, Mindy. Do you disagree? No, I completely agree. Oh, okay. Absolutely. If jobs aren't growing, it's a really great way to get a good deal on a house, but you're going to be stuck there for a long time. Yeah, these are simple things. And, and you know, if, I mean, if you do buy into a growing market, it's probably going, you know, in fact, I, I bought a house in 1981, a rental, actually eight units it was, um, and upside down immediately. I mean, I, I had to get crackheads to live there. I mean, it was just horrible. The market was just terrible. Um uh, but, you know, real estate will make you look smart over time. Uh, Tucson, where that was, was a growing city. Still is. Still own land there, as a matter of fact. But anyway, you can, same thing with the stock market. You could buy and the stock market crashes tomorrow. But if you wait long enough, you'll look smart. It's the same thing with real estate. So Yeah. Well, <laughs> we can also cite things like Detroit freaking bottomed out. Remember? Yeah. Uh, well, and, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Everything just disappeared. But in closing... Um, in closing, I want to read one more thing, which I meant to get to earlier, and I didn't. I know I'm talking way too much on this podcast, but <laughs> anyway, this is Robert Schiller. Everybody's familiar with him, right? Nobel yes. laureate e- economist. He won the Nobel Prize in 2013, I think. And he has had him Schiller on an Price old podcast before. <laughs> oh, he's he's. I, I really trust him, but I want to read to you something he wrote oh. personally. Okay, even at currently even at currently elevated U.S. home price levels, buying still makes sense for those who are set on ownership. But buyers need to be sure that they can accept what could be a rather bumpy and disappointing long-term path for home values. According to the latest S&P CoreLogic Case-Shiller Home Price Indices, U.S. home prices rose at a record 19.7% in the last year and now look very unstable. Now, here's your sentence. Here's your takeaway. They might increase further for a while, but that may be followed by serious declines. From his mouth. So be aware. That's the, that's really only the only negative I found though in all the research I did for this podcast. But but again, this guy he, he's practically God when it comes to real estate. I mean, this guy knows a lot. So be aware. I far be it for me to argue with him. I think that <laughs> 
prices are definitely not going to continue their meteoric rise. I think they can't. It's unsustainable. I do think, especially in my market, because I have uh, such a a unique set of circumstances where 1,100 houses just burned. So we have a lot more demand than other people might have. Um, I don't see prices falling. I see them flattening out. And I think that the interest rates are going to help with that. I think they do need to flatten out. You can't have 19% growth year after year after year after year, because then all of a sudden, my little nothing house is going to be worth $9 million. And I do not live in a $9 million house. I bought it for 300000 two years ago. And it is not that nice. Uh, not yet, but it will be. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, I, he's not wrong in that there is a change coming to the housing market. I just don't want to say, yeah, prices are going to fall. I think they're going to flatten out. I think they're going to level off and just continue with a more nominal rise. Or, you know, we might see a small dip, but not the 2008 drop yes. that we did. And I agree with you 100%, Mindy. And you know why? Because you're a goddess when it comes to housing. You know everything about it. And also, <laughs> because, and, and again, you know, one thing we should also reiterate, there's nothing more local than real estate. You know, yeah. I could have a horrible market and you could have a perfect one. You know, so nothing the, we say the, here is going to apply the, to everywhere. What's that phrase? They're not making any more new land. Yeah, well, <laughs> they I, that, aren't. that annoyed me when I, I bought my house for four hundred thousand dollars, and three years later, and I'm sorry, five years later, the housing market was exploding. I bought it in two thousand one, two thousand five. My friends are standing at a party, going like, "Stacy, you got to buy more houses, man. They don't make any more waterfront anymore." And I said, "You know, you're right." And they didn't make any more water, waterfront when I bought my house four years ago. And so, why is my house worth three times more than I paid for it four years later? I mean, it makes you know, that's just dumb. But anyway. Plenty of real estate stories to tell. Uh, any any closing comments? We have to go. Yeah, I mean, I just think once again, I uh, just want to reiterate, why are you doing it? What is your purpose? And then do you understand uh, how that dovetails into the market? Because like you were talking about like, oh, hey, you know, you don't want to buy real estate in a place where jobs aren't growing. Uh, but at the same time, it's like, well, if you have a remote job and it's a place you want to live um, and you're willing to stay in that house for a long time, maybe it works out. Uh, but really the bottom line is just figure out you know, okay, why am I doing this? What are my long-term goals? How does this fit into what's going on where I want to buy a house? And it, and it just, it does. It requires a little more thought and study and really saying, is this what I want? And does it help me reach my goals? You call yourself Miranda. I call you the voice of reason. <laughs> well spoken. <laughs> okay. If nobody has anything else. We got to get out of here. We're done. Okay. Let's do it. All right. I'm afraid we are out of time, folks, but we are never out of topic. Dig a little deeper. You're going to find links to lots more info in our show notes. And remember, if your goal is to make more, to spend less, to retire rich, your online home is moneytalksnews.com. And don't forget to check out Miranda's online home as well. That's mirandamarquit.com, M-A-R-Q-U-I-T, mirandamarquit.com. And visit Mindy at her website. That's biggerpockets.com. It's a great, she's a great podcast, too. I've listened to it many times. If you've got a question, comment, or topic you'd like to suggest, please tell us about it. Email us at hello at moneytalksnews.com. That's hello at moneytalksnews.com. And one last thing, if you like what we do, then do something for us. Subscribe to our podcast. Takes you two seconds, really helps us out though. So if you like us, show us and subscribe. I'm Stacy Johnson. And I'm Miranda Marquette. I'm Aaron Freeman. And I'm Mindy Jensen. Well done, Mindy. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out with us folks. We're gonna see you right here next time. <laughs>